Ladies and gentlemen, it is now 3.35 p.m. Fortunately, this year we don't have any exit instructions, but in case you do, it's the same door you came in on. Uh, so welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the pre-flight platform checklist presentation. If you're here for the doomsday presentation, that's next door. Go see that one. Okay, don't exhale. So myself, I'm Chris Weibel. This is Mr. Kevin Rutten. Both work for a little company called Stark and Wayne. We're all the idiots running around in the blue shirts and the, the main, uh, uh, what is that thing called? The hub, the foundry, thank you. That's down there, come visit us. If you got any questions after this. So I wanna start out by, uh, again, introducing myself, Chris Weibel. Uh, our talk today is uh, primarily about the lessons learned from deploying Bosch and Cloud Foundry. Uh, this is my sixth CF Summit talk not talk. Sixth time I've come to CF Summit. So in that time, we have seen a lot of ways of breaking Bosch, breaking Cloud Foundry, fixing, breaking, fixing, breaking, usually in production. Um, so back when we started all of this, the documentation around Cloud Foundry and uh, getting Bosch going was not exactly the most thorough thing in the world. Uh, there was a small treasure trove of carefully curated manifests to get Cloud Foundry going. There's some Google Docs um, that even until recently have been having a lot of additions to. And there were readmes that quickly became outdated uh, with every new version of Cloud Foundry and Bosch that came out there. Um, let's face it, it was a small miracle back then just to get Cloud Foundry running for the very first time. Um, yes, sir. This is me trying to go through my speaker notes that are a little longer than I was hoping they were. Okay. I'm getting yes. to this, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, in, this, in the subsequent years, uh, there have been a great number of resources <laughs> that are now available to us that weren't always there. Um, I wanna put out a special thank you to the docs.cloudfoundry.org folks. Done a phenomenal job. So anybody that has uh, contributed to that, I thank you now. I'm hoping some of you are here. Uh, if not, that's been a great value to us. Kevin, please click the next slide. Um, so, which brings us to the talk that we have here today. The docs out there are great, but there are still a lot of sharp edge cases that are out there. Uh, so for all of the bits and pieces that may have fallen off the end, I'll give you Mr. Kevin Rutten. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. So we're gonna break this into uh, three sections. We're gonna start with uh, the people and then move on to the IaaS and save the fun networking for last. And in all of them, there are a lot of big gotchas that we're going to be going through. Hopefully we'll highlight the common pitfalls that you may stall or that may stall your project. So actually, why people first? Uh, the first draft we wrote of this talk, we had, you know, IaaS and, and networking first, because that's kind of the obvious thing. But there's a lot of conversations. In real life, you're going to be talking to the people on your team and making these decisions. And that's actually where we're going to start our story. So you need to set expectations early on. So we're gonna start with just one that seems to be avoided in every conversation that, that uh, we talk to. When, where, and how are you going to maintain Cloud Foundry once it's up and running? And so when you're basically talking to the stakeholders, the managers, all the teams, please have this talk and figure out when can you have a maintenance window? When can we do the rolling stem cell upgrades? If you don't have this talk early and have buy-in and agreement, your foundation's going to be Jurassic. And sometimes you just need to make sure you have some quiet time. Most of the rolling restarts are painless and unnoticed. So that might give them a little bit of a you know, warm, fuzzy feeling, but have this talk. So, unlike the photo, backups are good. You need to decide what you want to back up. And 
You know, normally things like you backing up the database and you're backing up the blob store, it doesn't have to be that complicated. Uh, for some foundations, you can simply use the API to um, scrape all the users, org spaces, and quotas. And if you have proper pipelining, uh, all us good developers do that, right? Then if you have to restore Cloud Foundry, boot it back up again, deploy it, uh, create all the orgs and spaces, push all your apps again. But without a backup plan, your production environment is basically a, a proof of concept. First time you run into trouble, you're kind of hosed. You don't have any history or audit. Someone's going to ask, hey, what was that app that was deployed before it uh, went down or where are the assets? You're kind of stuck. So decide what you want to back up and where and how long. And this is something you have to talk about ahead of time. If you don't have these discussions before you even start, once you've deployed it, you may not have a place to do the backups and you're not doing backups and then you're going to run into problems. Get your backups running day one. You deploy it, do a backup on an empty foundation. It is really fast. Once you got the backup started, then as you start adding stuff, you don't have to worry about you know, a month down the road, oh, geez, we have to get backups going. Uh, we have you know, other talks going on about the Shield project, um, the, the, the Bosch backup and restore. There's lots of ways to do it. And well, I said get your backup done day one. That's also a good time to consider doing a restore. You do a backup, push a few apps in, do restore. If you've never tested your backups, you have binary data. You might not actually have backups. So when you're deploying your Cloud Foundry, you've got some choices you can make. Right? Do you have an internal or external DB? Do you have an internal or external blob store? And there are some pros and cons to each. The internal blob storing database built into Cloud Foundry, very well tested, very well integrated. When you are tearing down Cloud Foundry, everything's deleted, persistent disks are gone, everything's cleaned up. But the external ones, a little bit more work, you've got some huge advantages. If all your data is stored in external blob stores and external databases, you can actually tear down your Cloud Foundry and deploy back up again. Database is still intact, blob store is still intact, everything will come back up again. So that makes a big difference in your backup story is whether or not when you're doing any maintenance or you know, disaster recovery, did you have to back up your blob store manually? If you're using, let's say, S3 and it's replicated across regions, well, then you may not have to back up your blob store, which could be gigabytes of data, terabytes of data. So one of the things to also remember, and this is going to be a little bit different, back up your credential store, your credit hub, your vault. Um, backing it up is, is something you have to talk to your security team about because it's going to be done a little bit differently. But I like to actually back it up and take incrementals because sometimes when you're doing restore, you need the credentials at a point in time and you can go to your backup list and restore that backup and boom, you have a state at time to know which credentials you are using. Kevin, real quick. One thing I wanted to point out is, uh, I forget it's either UAA or the CredHub database, sorry, UAA or CCDB. Um, the encryption for that particular database is stored in CredHub. So if you're backing up your, your cloud controller and UAA databases and you go to restore them to a new environment, but you regenerated your CredHub variables, you're not going to be able to read that old data. So make sure you're backing up all of the databases that you've got there. Thank you. Yeah. You basically, you know, the common practice is you try and back up everything at points in time. So don't back up your credential databases, you know, once a month, but your infrastructure once a day because you're going to enter that problem. So now we're saying do backups, do backups. Um, one of the ones that you can run into is never back up the Locket database. Or actually, you can back it up, just never restore it. Um, the database gets put back in, the locks are put back into place, but now there's nothing to release the locks, so those locks will never be released. And that will cause you lots of fun in the future. Wasted a Tuesday morning with that. <laughs>
So with the people, you are going to have a firewall team, a security team, an infrastructure team, weeks ahead of time, get to know them. Like, you know, maybe take them out for, for a lunch, maybe make sure they are working in the same area, because when you're doing any sort of deploy, you're going to be talking to them often. The day before you're deploying is not the day to talk to them. I mean, that's the day you're going to find out that the team is going on vacation the next day, and you're like, uh. So you're going to be talking with them, Make sure you're talking to them often. Make sure that you're um, including them in the conversations, keeping them in the loop. So you also want to test the assets. These teams are going to give you stuff like SSL certificates, uh, which I'm going to pick on because they're fun. Uh, do you have SSL certificates? And do they have the correct DNS, wildcards, aliases? Um, did they give you the intermediate certs? Have you checked that they match? Do you have the DNS set up and do they match these certificates? I've been a few places where the certificates showed up and they have the wrong domain name. And now you got that two week, ooh, I got to reprovision, I got to order it, it has to go through purchasing, fun to go through. And finally, install Doomsday. So I made a joke a little earlier about, uh, hey, there's a Doomsday talk going on right now. Uh, so Stark and Wind has also given a talk about Doomsday, which is a great little application that goes out there and looks at the certificates when they expire. You don't want to know that your certificates have expired after they have. Uh, it makes cleaning up your production environment a whole heck of a lot harder. So I encourage you to... Uh, when you get back home, I'm assuming these are being recorded, go back and check out that particular presentation. Yeah, it turns out that if you let your NATS certificate expire, then when you do a deploy and Bosch tries to talk to the agents to update the certificates, the certificates have expired and they don't want to talk and then you have to go through all the fun of manually trying to fix all the instances which can be kind of scripted, but still is very, very painful. So tools like Doomsday will give you a bit of a heads up. Get so what's on the screen here is actually a, uh, a screenshot of uh, the, the CLI version of the tool. There will be a GUI version that you can deploy <laughs> straight to Cloud Foundry. But this in this case, you can see that, hey, whatever our coolsite.com site is here, within the next two weeks, uh, if nobody makes any changes, we're going to have a production issue uh, because that certificate is going to expire. That's bad. Yeah, this is actually set up in my profile, so every time I log into the jump box, I get the list. So one of the other things, very critical, when you get the SSL certificates, check that the key and the certificate match. Check the modulus. If they don't match, when you go to deploy, HA proxy or whatever load balancer you're using is going to complain and possibly blow up. And then you have to go to your security department and start the requisition and wait two weeks and so on and so on. Uh, so this is also something that you should try and um, set up is to pair with someone on your deploy. You know, we are very big proponents of pairing of the knowledge transfer. I work at an amazing company. All the people I work with are amazing. My co-pilot here is a fantastically funny and you know, moderately smart guy. So pairing is quite critical because um, it helps save you from fat fingers. It's the knowledge transfer. It's making sure that you're not the only person who knows how the foundation is set up. So you get the phone call Sunday night saying, Hey, can you come in? Now there's a 50-50 chance that he'll get called. So all of you guys have been in rooms together and meetings together and knocked out all the discussions and you're gonna make your choice of uh, infrastructure. And you've got a couple choices. You've got the, the classic vSphere and you're gonna need the vCenter IP, username, password, choose whether you're using the internal or external database, are you going to be using WebDAV, NAS, Minio, some other blob store, HA proxy, uh, another load balancer, where are you going to terminate the SSL? 
you've got the grandfather of the cloud, AWS, you've got your access keys and secrets, internal database, RDB, RDS databases, WebDAV, S3, another data store, uh, HI proxy, ELBs, and a little balancer where you're going to terminate the SSL connections. You've got Azure subscriptions, resources, tenants, internal or Azure SQL, WebDAV, or Azure Object Store, HA Proxy, or Azure Load Balancer. Where will the SSL be terminated? Google Compute Platform, Service Account Key, internal or Cloud SQL, WebDAV, or Cloud Storage, or other, HA Proxy, Cloud Load Balancers, or another Load Balancer. Where will the SSL termination be? And OpenStack. Account details, internal, external, SQL, WebDAV, Swift, another object store, HA proxy, Octavia, another load balancer. Where will the SSL termination be? So on the last five slides, we covered five different infrastructures, and we had five different questions on there. Uh, it's very important to know the answers to those five questions. We bring them up because we see those are not necessarily answered when we go on site. Um, you need answers to those five questions. Depending on how you answer them, there are severe implications about where you've put your databases, where you've put your blob stores that can result in outages just from the way that you've designed your system from these five decisions alone. So while we kind of glossed over those maybe just a little bit, you need answers to those five questions. So most of the ISs, except vSphere, are, most of the ISs, they look pretty much the same, but there are subtle differences. Actually, some big differences. So when you're looking at documentation, most of the IASs, except for vSphere, need a Bosch registry. Depending on the documentation you look at, port uh, 25777 is often not listed. Every IAS has its own branding, its own flavors and features. Not all features are available in all regions either. So you have to be careful of that. And when you're following the docs, which is important, you also have to be very aware of which infrastructure the docs were written for, because they will probably be skipping steps from other infrastructures that you're gonna need. So, um, yeah, definitely keep in mind that the differences between them, there's a lot of difference in terminology. Uh, the pricing tiers, you're gonna find that even though you know, they have um, the you know, VMs per hour price. When you start adding in access to the, the network traffic, very different pricing. And the feature parity between platforms. And so once you get your IS keys, take a few minutes, do some testing. Uh, do your credentials, do your IM, uh, IM keys allow you to create and delete buckets, create and delete uh, files. Uh, most of these things, you know, Amazon has a tool you can download, Azure has a tool, Minio has a tool. Download those, use your credentials, just take five minutes, try and exercise it. Make sure that uh, you can actually create or destroy something. Yeah, I'm 0 for 6 on my last production deploys on the set of credentials that I get for the underlying infrastructure. I actually do all of the things that I need them to do, whether it's create a VM, create a bucket. Uh, key one I had was I can write to the bucket, but I can't read the bucket. That was cute. Um, so yeah, go ahead. Just because you got a set of credentials, don't make any sort of assumptions that the permissions that you've gotten will actually work. Um, and try to test those out before you're trying to do a Bosch deploy and then trying to debug that. Some real simple tools out there, go ahead and use them. Yeah, also realize that your security team, they are gonna try very hard to minimize attack services, give you the least permissions possible. So the keys you're gonna get are probably gonna be missing stuff. Um, you may actually want to consider talking to them about getting your own private account and basically doing all your deploys there so that your infrastructure is separate from anyone else's. Might make things a bit easier. Um, now, when you're talking to them about getting your own account, make sure you're not the person with the credit card. Doesn't matter if you have a corporate card from the company, don't use it. Don't fall into the trap. When the credit card screen comes up, find somebody whose job it is to have the credit card number, have them put it in. Because what happens is you're deploying, everything's going great, the card expires, 
the infrastructure gets turned off. And then they're going to look whose card was it. Oh, it was your card. How come you didn't update it? Right? So there are people whose basically the job is to make sure that the cards are paid, the cards are active. If the cards are stolen, addresses change, all handled. Right? Amazon has umbrella accounts. Set your account up, put it under the umbrella. Right? Um, I've had you know, an issue where uh, the credit card got declined, infrastructure just disappeared. Uh, on that vein, with all these infrastructures, you can usually get an account manager, get to know them, talk to them periodically. Sometimes if uh, the credit card gets declined, instead of turning off the infrastructure, they might give you a phone call first to let you update it. Right? But so get to know your um, account manager. So we talked a few minutes ago about the fact that uh, when your certs expire, you're going to have a problem. When your credit card expires, you're going to have every problem. So networking is a big can of worms to talk about. And we've already been talking a little bit about TCP ports. You're going to have to basically go through the documentation and SSL, bootstrapping, director, NAT. That's going to be in one document. And then CredHub, UAA, application SSH, Shield, registry. This is not a complete list. Nowhere will you find a complete list. You are going to basically have to go through everything you're installing, everything you're working with, find that list and build it. And uh, I recommend you do something like this where you actually label what the ports are for because your security department is going to say, you gave me these IP addresses, what are they for? So, If your company has a corporate firewall, factor in a couple days to debug them every time, as you'll have problems with them every time. If your company has a proxy to access the internet, factor in a few days to debug them every time, as you'll have problems with them every time. New rules get added, definitions get updated. You may need to disable, or they may decide to disable uh, pings for a CV or something. Stuff changes, and you want to have your security team uh, on speed dial if they have any of this stuff, you are going to be on the phone with them. Um, also be careful of home router ranges. So when you're setting up your network, avoid the common you know, 192.168.0, the 10.0.1. So I was working with a customer uh, months ago, VPNed into their network, tried to log into their jump box, timed out. Tried to log into the jump box again, timed out. Looking at it, why am I trying to SSH into my printer? Oh, their network and my network have the same IP range. It won't route. You're going to be causing a world of headache if you use these IP ranges for your network because anytime you have a VPN, there's going to be somebody on your team who's going to have a problem. Now, in my case, I found a workaround. I went onto the guest network, which was on a different IP range, but that's kind of annoying. So isolation segments, uh, those are a little bit easier to deal with. If you're booting up multiple foundations, you can use the same IP ranges for all of them because they're isolated. But you do have to work with your services team. Make sure that your isolation segments and their services IPs don't overlap. Otherwise, the containers can't talk to your database, your Redis, any of that sort of stuff. Um, and Ethernet needs to flow downhill. Uh, I believe that's completely self-explanatory. So um, there's you know lots of things you have to check out. Um, if you have a DNS setup, double check it's returning the correct private IP addresses instead of public ones. If you're on uh, AWS, for instance, and it's returning the public IP addresses for S3, you get billed at a slightly different rate than if you're using the private IP addresses inside because the traffic goes out and comes back in again and it's a different tier. Um, check your VM sizing and disk sizing. <laughs> Make your disks bigger than you think you're going to need them. So remember, you can run out of resources, so try and you know, plan ahead that you're not going to fill up. So any questions? 
as you can see, I helped with a few of the slides. Um, so, like Kevin said, if there's any questions, cool, we'll answer them now. Um, if not, you can come see us down at the, it's not the hub, what is it called again? The Foundry. The Foundry. Um, we'll be the people. B4. B4. Uh, we'll be the people that are standing there and kind of chilling out because our talk is done with. Feel free to ask us any questions you've got. But uh, otherwise, I want to thank you folks for showing up today. And uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.